Hi there. This is something that's a little bit weird for me to do because it's uh, not something I do a whole lot of. Um, I've tried three different ways with three different cameras to do this, so now I'm using a webcam, which is why my words aren't quite lined up with my mouth. Anyhow, I have a lot of family and you know people that I've known for a long time that are Pentecostals, Charismatics, uh, and I'm not. I was raised in that church and been through a lot of stuff. And so this is basically my explanation and I suppose an exegesis as to why I'm not a Pentecostal. Um, basically, my purpose here is to biblically evaluate Pentecostalism and Charismaticism. Um, the Bible says to test everything, to see if it lines up with Scripture, and that's what I intend to do. Um, I should say at the outset, I have no intention of trying to tear down the body of Christ or divide it, um, not trying to put anybody down, not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, um, and I don't want anybody for a second to think that I don't think that there are plenty of people within the Pentecostal charismatic realm that are genuinely saved. Um, not to say everybody, but then again, there's you know plenty of tears among the wheat everywhere. Um, this isn't something that's the product of me you know, chasing a, one person's teaching or anything like this. It's actually something that I started to look into even way back before I graduated Teen Challenge in 1998. Um, so, while you know, I have come across people that have helped in my understanding of why things are the way they are, um, help me see some of the errors in charismatic and Pentecostal doctrine. It, this isn't something where I just hopped on a bandwagon. This was something that was already in my heart and I just followed the breadcrumbs, basically. Um, not attempting to be holier than thou at all. Um, I know for a fact that there's been plenty of times in my life that I've believed things that weren't true, that you know my beliefs had to change and evolve as I gained more knowledge and more understanding of you know whether it's scripture or whatever else. Um, I, I basically, like I said, want to take everything to the test of scripture and chew on the meat, spit out the bones. Um, kind of been waiting for a while to try to find the right time you know, and, and to basically let everybody that I know know where I stand. Um, it's been kind of a, I don't know, it's just it's something that's not easy to bring up when so many people that you know and care about believe different um, you know and now I have some family that are planning on moving halfway across the country to go to you know uh, some Pentecostal ministry schools and things like that and I guess I just want to know you know I want them to know, you know family friends whoever uh, where I stand and why I believe what I do because I think it's very important that everybody not only have beliefs, but be able to defend them, be able to explain why they have them. Um, I guess to start out, in Romans 10, Paul is talking about the Israelites, and I think a lot of Pentecostals and Charismatics could fall under the same uh, banner, if you will, as what Paul is saying about the Israelites uh, in Romans 10 verse 2 he says 
for I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And I think one of the biggest negatives of the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement has been that they tend to use scripture more for proof text than as the basis and foundation of what they believe. And I'll get into that more in a bit. Um, I want to start out and you know, to really get into this by asking a question that I think everyone in the Christian church needs to ask themselves and answer. Um, it's a question that I think a lot of Charismatics and Pentecostals would instantly give the, the, the right answer. But when you look at what they preach, what they teach, what they do, not everything lines up with what they would give for an answer. So here's the question. Does experience determine truth? Or vice versa, does truth determine experience? Uh, countless, countless Pentecostal churches are absolutely enamored with experiences. They want you to experience God, experience healing, experience the gift of tongues, experience, experience, experience. So are all these experiences a valid test of God's truth? I'm going to go to the Bible now. In Matthew chapter 24, um, start. Jesus is given you know, a big spiel here, but when he starts getting into uh, you know, verses 21 on, it, it, he starts to kind of get into some warnings. Um, and I'm going to start actually at Matthew 24, verse 24 and 25. Uh, Jesus himself, it's red letters so you know it's Jesus, says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Now, the very fact that he puts a suffix on the back end of his, his warning and says, Behold, as in, look, take note, I'm telling you this in advance. Um, that should kind of be a clue that what he just said is important. That there's something in there that he really doesn't want people to miss. So... Let's let's read it again and, and chew on it a bit. He says, For there shall, doesn't say there might, maybe, someday, possibly, he says there shall. It's going to happen. Probably more than once, more than twice, probably for the rest of the time. Who knows? He says it will happen. Arise false Christ, so people claiming to be a Messiah, be a Savior, have uh, supernatural powers in and of themselves, or at least not of God. Um, there shall be false prophets. It, it's going to happen. And they shall show great signs and wonders. In fact, they're going to be so great, they're going to look so authentic, so real, they're going to be such good counterfeits he goes on to say, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, these aren't going to be, you know, what he's talking about. They're, they're not simply, you know, uh, magicians doing some, you know, pulling rabbits out of hats. They're going to be doing things that look like signs and wonders that people would mistake a, a true uh, Christian, a true prophet to be doing because otherwise they wouldn't think they, they wouldn't be called a false prophet they, they, nobody would think that they're a prophet, nobody would think it if they weren't doing all these signs and wonders 
Now, one thing about false prophets, false teachers, whatever, no matter how good their signs are, false doctrine always follows. They, they, you know, they, and in fact, sometimes they'll even mix a nugget of truth in there once in a while just to try and keep it more sneaky. But the majority of what they say, you can throw it out with the bathwater. Don't have to worry about tossing a baby. But, like I said, the, the doctrines, the signs, the wonders of, of people are going to be so convincing that they, if the elect could be deceived, they would be the ones doing it. Um, and it's very possible. Jesus doesn't say they're all intentionally doing this. They're not intentionally uh, deceiving people. They're, they're not intending to be false prophets. It's very, very likely they probably think they're on the right track. They probably think that what they're doing is of God, that the signs and wonders they're doing are being done by the power of God. Um, and, you know, it's very possible that these are the very ones that Jesus also says in, in Scripture are going to say, Lord, Lord, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not do many miracles and signs and wonders in your name? And he's going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And they're going to be taken by surprise. So, you know, so much of, of the Pentecostal movement, Pentecostal churches, Pentecostal believers are just fixated on signs and wonders and miracles and healings and all this stuff when the very things that they are looking for, the very things that they're begging, praying, fasting, seeking God to do, are the very things Jesus says there's going to be some pretty sneaky fakes. So at the very least, the fact that he give, he, he says in verse 25, Behold, I, I told you before, it, it's you know a stern warning. It should give some people at least a little bit of pause and probably should get a lot of people double checking what they're seeing and what's going on and taking everything every experience every every you know miracle or so-called miracle take it back to scripture and see if it lines up but back to the the question i asked does does experience determine truth or does truth determine experience? The truth has to determine what are true spiritual experiences. You can't, if you take your experiences, hold on, there's a train coming. If you take experiences and you allow them to dictate what's truth, then your experiences become the final authority not the Word of God. And for any true believer, anyone that's saying that there's a, a more, a higher authority or more final authority than the written Word of God, that should be sending off warning signs and bells and whistles everywhere. By letting experience determine truth, you make your experiences, in fact, you make yourself the final authority and when you do that then scripture simply exists not as guidance not as a set of doctrine something to learn from and to live by it simply becomes proof text to dig through it and try to find a little fragment here and a little fragment there that you can twist around and use to validate the experience you had Now, there are those within the Pentecostal arena that say that a person that hasn't had the, the experiences that Pentecostals have or, or claim to have has no right to criticize the movement because they've never had it. They, they've never experienced it. How can they know? They can't know the power of God if they've never spoken tongues, if they've never been slain in the spirit, if they, you know, 
If they haven't ever been healed, they can't say anything about that yet. They, they, they haven't experienced it. They don't know. Well, that's, that's just a form of, of intimidation because you know, there's plenty in the Bible that you can know what the Bible says about without experiencing it. You don't have to go and experience homosexuality or commit murder to know what the Bible says about them. So you don't have to experience the things that Pentecostals uh, do experience or claim to experience in order to see if they line up with Scripture. Now, I think it's important at the get-go to lay out the fact that there are true spiritual experiences. So what are they? A true spiritual experience is always the quickening of the truth of God in a believer, and it cannot exist apart from the truth. In a true spiritual experience, God's word is always the starting point. Let me give you an example. A true spiritual experience would be strong feelings of remorse for sin. Now, God's word has to be the starting point because how do you know what sin is unless God's word tells you or somebody tells you what God's word says, in which case it's still coming back to his word. Um, that's a true spiritual experience. It, in fact, it's the one that leads people to salvation, to repentance. It's a, absolutely a spiritual experience. Um, another one would be trust in God in an impossible or, or a traumatic experience or a situation. You know, something happens that, you know, just blows your mind, wrecks your life, and somehow you still have a peace. You still trust that you are in God's hands and that he has everything and you're not going to freak out you're not going to be afraid that's a true spiritual experience and it starts with the word of God that you know you know because you know that the Bible says that you know he's got you um, uh, another true spiritual experience would be uh, overwhelming desire for the lost to be saved or joy when they are um, or when through God's word you see an area of your life that needs to change and then you act in obedience. These are all true spiritual experiences. You know, no, they aren't flashy. Most of them don't even have to happen with anybody else around. They're not going to gather crowds, but they are true spiritual experiences. And every single one is rooted in God's word. It's, it's our response. Like I said, it, it's the quickening of truth of the truth of God in a believer. It's how a person responds to the truth of God's word. And it's always starting at God's word. Now, false spiritual experiences, on the other hand, are the kind that lead you to the truth. Uh, a false spiritual experience would be one where this is what happened to me or what I heard happened to somebody else because there's a whole lot of hearsay and a whole lot of wild stories in uh, Pentecostalism. You know, this is what happened to me, therefore it must be true. It has to be of God because I had this spiritual experience. And that's a hallmark of a false spiritual experience. Um, this mindset almost always assumes an experience is of God, no matter how wild or crazy or insane or off the wall it is, and whether or not there's any kind of scriptural evidence behind it to back it up. Um, you know, and this is why so many people within the Pentecostal arena spend so much time using scripture for proof texts because and that involves a whole lot of twisting and, and misinterpreting scripture which we're going to get to in time um, you know, they do that to validate their experiences to, to so called you know, prove that it was a, a godly experience when really there might not be any evidence of that you know that 
it's it's pretty popular nowadays to, to have supposed gold dust come through the air during a, a church service, you know, which you got to think people might be putting some glitter in the ventilation system. But the, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that would promote that. There, you know, there's no part in the Bible where God appeared and there was gold glitter in the air. And you know, it, but people say, "Oh, well, it has to be God." Does it? Really? Especially if it doesn't say anything in the Bible about it? No. A false spiritual experience looks at scripture with bias in an attempt to find evidence to validate the experience rather than looking at it objectively in an attempt to find truth. If, uh, if we go to 2 Peter chapter 1, Now Peter was one of just you know he he was part of a pretty amazing experience um, when Jesus went onto the Mount of Transfiguration. He, you know him and John are are with Jesus, who is in his human body, and all of a sudden, bam! Jesus gets trans transfigured into his glory body, his glorious body, his heavenly body, whatever you want to call it, all of a sudden, he's still Jesus, but, wow, he's way bigger, way better, way, yeah, they, they fell on their faces, and, and then it's not just him, he's talking with Moses and Elijah, the two, you know, two of the main people of the, the Jewish religion, and, you know, that's one heck of an experience. You know, I mean, all through history, hardly anybody, you know, the vast majority of humanity, has never had it. So, Second Peter chapter one. We'll uh, start at verse sixteen. He says, "For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's talking about being on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Christ in all his glory. He goes on, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So there he says this is where it happened. He's, he's recalling his, his, you know, experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. But, now verse 19, he goes on, and he switches gears a little bit. He says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, unto which ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Peter had an experience. He had an experience that if, if people today had that, they would base their entire life's ministries on it. No doubt, I mean, people already base ministries off of you know, supposedly going to heaven and and doing this, doing that. God showing them a vision, and that's all they talk about for the rest of their lives. That Peter totally could have because he had the real thing. He was with Christ, and it happened to him. But what does he say? He says, "I had this experience. I saw Christ in." in all is glory, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. And when he's saying prophecy, he's not saying you know, the just foretelling. He's talking about prophecy as in the the proclaimed word of God. So that would be scripture. So, in essence, you know, to summarize 
those what are five verses, six verses, what he's saying is God's word is more sure than any experience, even real ones. God's word has to be the base of everything. Now, if we go back to uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 19 says a few things about God's word. And we'll start at verse 7. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, those few verses have a few different adjectives that are used to describe God's word. It says that God's word is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. In fact, if you go one more verse, verse 10 says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, more than fine gold, or much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey of the honeycomb. Now, that's kind of a far cry from a lot of Pentecostal churches today who are enamel uh, enameled, <laughs> they'd love to be enameled with gold, um, enamored with seeing gold. You know, God, you know, I, don't, I can't even remember how many times I heard about uh, Carlos Anacondia, the Argentine evangelist who supposedly had people getting gold fillings in their teeth before he would even get to the message, which makes no sense if God made the teeth, why can't he just give them new teeth that aren't gold, that are real? Um, you know, or like I already talked about, the, the gold dust in the air, it, it People seem enamored with, with gold, but why? I mean, it, God's God. He's not impressed with money. He doesn't have to flaunt it. But God's word is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. Now, we're going to hop back to the New Testament, to 2 Timothy 3, to a very important and rather definitive section of scripture, but I'm going to pause and I'm going to put this on the next part of the video.